HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. ¿Por qué esta Coca-Cola de McDonald's sabe tan bien? ¿Será la máquina? ¿Será el popote o el hielo? O oh, quizás soy yo. No sé, Diego, pero vámonos, ¿no? El ¿Por qué esto sabe tan bien, Deal? Un refresco de cualquier tamaño por un dólar. Solo en el one 2 3 dollar menu de McDonald's. Precios y participación pueden variar. No se puede combinar con cualquier otro oferta o combo. Mío, Coca-Cola es una marca registrada de The Coca-Cola Company. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth. Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast continues to gain recognition as a great resource for uh, small business owners, uh, managers, leaders, salespeople, entrepreneurs, I mean, just really uh, just about anywhere in business. We uh, recently discovered that we are on the list of 12 business podcasts on uh, Forbes.com, uh, 12 business podcasts that uh, people should be listening to. So that's pretty exciting. And it is really because of the guests who join me to share their expertise with all of you. So through this podcast, you can get the information that you need, uh, ideas, suggestions, uh, training, education, whatever you want to call it, uh, in whatever areas you feel like uh, you need it. And today is no different. Today my guest is Thomas Young. Thomas is the co-founder and VP of Marketing Ops at Rocket Dollar, a self-directed investment company that assists clients in investing securely and easily in real estate, precious metals, and more. Thomas is a marketing professional with years of experience in the startup community. His close contact with many self-directed investors led him to identify a strong need for a platform combining the best attributes of a self-directed account while leveraging the best technology of the day to make it easy to operate. Thanks so much for joining me today, Thomas. Hey, thanks for having me, Diane. Much appreciated. 
Well, happy to have you here. I am curious, um, given that this industry that you're in, uh, what is the most surprising investment you've heard of someone making? Oh boy! So the most one of the most uh, surprising things that I see people doing with their self-directed IRAs that we set up for them is uh, there's been really a renewed um, interest in the cryptocurrency space uh, in the last sort of six months as as Bitcoin and some of these other things have, have sort of rebounded. Um, that's that's surprising because I I didn't expect people to sort of have an appetite for that much risk. Uh, but it seems to be working for a lot of people. Um, so that's, that's certainly one of the things I've been most surprised by. Uh, we expected mostly, uh, to see very heavy in real estate and, uh, and, uh, private companies, startups or what have you. But, uh, yeah, the cryptocurrency space has been, has been one of the most surprising things for me personally. Yeah, that is really interesting. And do you think it's going to pay off for those people? You know, personally, I am not as, as versed as I, as I maybe should be. Um, but I think that as more volatility comes into public markets, uh, people are going to naturally look uh, outside, of, outside of traditional um, assets. And so, you know, should we head into a recession in the next you know, 12 to 18 months, as, as a lot of people are predicting, I think that uh, there will be a renewed interest in these, uh, you know, sort of cryptocurrency alternative assets. So, it might not be a bad time to get into them. That's so interesting. It, it's a weird sort of thing that I, I, I guess what I wonder is people who are deciding to go ahead and get involved in that, do they really get it? Like, do they really understand what it is and the volatility of it? Or is that what draws them to it? You know, I think that, I think that it's it's all sorts. I think there's some people that have certainly gotten caught in the sort of hysteria uh, of it all, and and I think that there are some some people that that really believe in it, and not only the technology, but just what sort of cryptocurrency stands for, um, and they and they believe that. Um, so so I think it's a healthy mix. I think that some people are just, you know, it's it's the latest uh, get rich quick scheme, if you will. Uh, and there's certainly some people, people like that, that have gotten into it uh, just, you know, instead of flying to Vegas, maybe they bought some crypto. Um, and then there's, and then there's definitely people that, that understand the underlying technologies, understand what it stands for, what it represents. Uh, and that's what they're, what they're buying. And, uh, and so I think, it, I think it's a healthy mix, but I, I do think that there is a lot of uh, hysteria around it. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. You know, latest and greatest or latest, uh, who, who really knows? Um, but, but I am curious um, really about other options. So, so and, and real estate is an interesting one for me. Um, I'm just I'm really curious about it because I think people are really used to the traditional, you have a mutual fund or IRA or bonds. Uh, but what are the other options that someone, you know, forget cryptocurrency for a minute, but what are other options people have for investment? Sure. So it, it might even be easier for me to tell you what you can't do, because when we started Rocket Dollar, uh, my two co-founders and I really decided that we were going to take the training wheels off, sort of say, where we were going to allow you to do anything um, that the IRS will allow you to do. And the IRS really has a short list of what you cannot do. And so things like collectibles, uh, you can't, for example, go out and buy a, a classic car or a piece of art, though it may be an investment uh, and pay off in the future, they, they don't allow you to do those things. Um, so really what, what people, it's, it's fascinating for us uh, when we look at data about what our customers are doing, um, most, most people are, are investing in, buy and hold um, rental properties, be it the single family or multifamily. Uh, they're investing in real estate syndicates. So anything that self storage, uh, things like that. Uh, they're making private startup investments as, as angels uh, using their IRAs or their, like we said, cryptocurrencies. And those are sort of our big buckets. Uh, but then there's also lending and crowdfunding and revenue sharing and all sorts of different things. 
Uh, so really it's, it's kind of, as long as you, you steer um, clear of the, of the IRS prohibited transactions, um, the world is sort of your oyster. And that's really what we approached Rocket Dollar with the belief that everybody should be able to invest their money the way they should, the, the, the way they want to, excuse me, not the way that some uh, mutual fund provider thinks you should. Right, right, right. Yeah, I like that idea. Okay. Um, so, so I, I want to sort of back up to that what you were talking about, crowdfunding or angel investing. So some people are choosing to take their dollars and invest in other businesses that they think yeah. are, yeah. right, are, are going to be, okay. Absolutely. Is that, um, like with crowdfunding, do you see that as something that is uh, sort of available to more of the mainstream than something like angel investing? Like, you know, because, it feels like people don't have to have a ton of money to be able to do crowdfunding. Yeah. Yeah. And the big difference really between angel investing and crowdfunding uh, is really the way that the, the capital raise is structured. And, and with the jobs act uh, in 2012, it sort of opened the door uh, for more uh, let's call it main street or maybe not ultra, ultra high net worth investors to access the sort of deals. And, you know, in the last six or seven years, we've seen the space mature where, you know, before it was sort of, um, you know, you, you went to crowdfunding as sort of a last resort if you couldn't raise money from traditional angels. Uh, and, you know, to be, a, to be an angel, you have to have, you, you have to be an accredited investor. So it's, there's certain income requirements and, and some certain uh, net worth requirements, which really shut out a lot of people. Um, but now with, with crowdfunding maturing um, as, a, as a really viable way for a lot of companies to raise money, uh, you are seeing more more Main Street investors being able to get into these deals and write, you know, maybe not a twenty five thousand dollar check, but a thousand dollar check or a five hundred dollar check is is um, you know it's much more accessible to a lot of people, and and it's not just companies that weren't able to raise money. Now you have real bona fide businesses uh, going the crowdfunding route as a real way to raise money. Interesting. Okay, so let's talk some about real estate. You said um, before when you were talking about real estate, you were, you were I think you were differentiating between uh, the kind of real estate wet that you live in. So, mm -hmm. um, and I apologize, what you I, it was interesting you called it something, and I it's totally slipped my mind what that is. <laughs> um, but then, what are other like real estate, I, I know there's like flipping, but are there other sorts of real estate vehicles people can use to, um, you know, build a, an investment portfolio? Sure. And, and from what we're seeing um, from our customers and what the investments that they're making, uh, residential real estate is only, is only a part of it. Uh, but there's, I mean, we have, we have customers that they want to create supplemental income, for example, or they want to create cash flow. And so they might buy a rental property or a fourplex or something like that, and then, and then collect rent off of those properties. And it flows back into their IRA tax free. Uh, and that's, and that's certainly a viable option. And then we have customers that are buying uh, raw land in remote places, hoping that a city will expand and grow into it. Uh, you know, that's, that's certainly a viable option. And then we have people that are, that are not investing in direct real estate, but rather through a fund uh, that's maybe has a strategy that, you know, to buy secondary, uh, to buy uh, self storage um, complexes in secondary markets or, or flipping or something. So really it's, it's, the range is so wide. I mean, anything from residential to commercial to buy and hold to rental to flipping, it really is, it really is just a huge spectrum of what you can do inside real estate which is great because then depending on what your individual goals, what your risk tolerance is, what your, um, you know, it's also has to do a little bit with your network, who you know and what they're doing, um, you know, has influence on the sort of deals that you get into. Uh, but I'd like to think that there is, there is a real estate investment for everybody. Um, and it's just not the same one for everybody. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to take a quick sponsor break, and then I want to ask you some more questions about that. Okay. Accelerate Your Business Growth Podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. 
Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. They have over 150,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to them on any device, including whatever you're hearing us on right now. And if you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth, you get one free audiobook and a one-month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are Do Business Better by Damian Mason and Breathe to Succeed by Sandy Abrams. So visit audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth, explore the books that are of interest to you, and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. Today we're speaking with Thomas Young about making good um, decisions in your business and good um, investment decisions. So before I move over to the business side of things, um, I had a question for you. about. So how does someone, if someone was thinking to themselves, yeah, I'd like to invest in real estate. I don't really know anything about real estate, and I don't want to be the person swinging the hammer or doing the buying and selling how do they even find out where opportunities are? Sure. Um, so a lot of it has to do with, so there, there's a couple of ways that, and, and there's some companies now uh, that make it really easy to get into real estate. So companies like Fundrise, uh, you know, companies that you can invest, they're com- completely online um, and they look a lot like a traditional broker, except for the different assets that, um, you're investing in. So for someone that knows nothing and, and knows no one that wants some exposure to real estate, some of these online platforms are fantastic places to start. Um, now, if you, if you're in a, in a city where you have a little bit of a network uh, and you want to invest in the space in real estate without, like you said, swinging a hammer, uh, I really think that a fund is the best way to do it. Uh, and there's, and there's all sorts of funds. There's funds that are focused on flipping. There's funds that are focused on buy and hold and, and, uh, appreciation uh, and there's funds that focus on commercial there's you know there's all sorts uh, so a fund I think would be the best way to do it and, and probably the best way to get exposure to some of the people doing these things um, you know for example I live in Austin Texas and we have a very healthy real estate investment community and they and they have meetups and they have events and and it's sort of like uh, matchmaking if you will you get investors that come in that have capital to deploy and then you have people that have projects that they're working on that they need capital for. Um, so there's there's a lot of ways to do it, but a lot of it is networking and uh, and getting yourself into the into the room with some of these people. Uh, and if you really don't want to do that, then then like I said, some of these online platforms are fantastic places to start. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I, I didn't even realize there were online platforms that could do that. So that is terrific. Okay, so if someone is um, thinking about starting a business, or maybe they they just started it. Uh, what are your recommendations for like things they should do first or think about first? Yeah, well, I think it I think it would obviously depend on the type of business that they're starting. But I think there are some fundamentals that apply to to any business, and certainly things that we did at Rocket Dollar, um, sort of on day one. And, and for us, it was really, uh, we, we were very organized. Um, we were very clear in what we wanted to do. We didn't really just start a business just to start and have a business. Um, and, and we started sort of firing on all cylinders at the very beginning. I think a lot of businesses spend so much time on things that, uh, that you can change later, things like logos and, and names and stuff like that. I think at the beginning, it's really about getting your sort of house in order getting everything prepared uh, so that then you can go sell whatever it is, whatever product it is you're, you're selling. Um, so for us, it was just staying organized, staying clean, um, making sure that all of our legal documents were in order and, and then starting to ramp up everything together, sort of, uh, you know, not having, not spending a ton of time building product without seeing if anybody even wanted it or selling something that we hadn't built yet, for example, um, so we started marketing, selling and building product sort of concurrently and testing the whole way. Um, so I think it's, I think it's, you know, obviously, like, like I said, it, it depends on the sort of business, but I think being very clear on what your intentions are, um, is a huge first step. There's a, we see a lot of entrepreneurs that, that know they want to be entrepreneurs, but they don't really know what they're going to do or how they're going to do it or who they're going to do it with yet. 
Um, so until, until you have those sort of things lined up, uh, I think it makes sense to, I, I don't know, keep your day job, for example, um, while you work some of those things. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And, and so um, are you familiar with uh, Lean Startup, the book Lean Startup, or the concept of yeah. Lean Startup? Okay. Yeah. I, so think it's, I think it's a sounds, fantastic place to start is some of those resources. Okay, great. So, so, so I guess that's what I'm trying to make sure I understand. So do you think, because, uh, you know, what they say is you don't have to have everything figured out go ahead and create as much of it as possible, get it in front of an audience and let them tell you what mm -hmm. it should have kind of thing. So Absolutely. is that, okay. Okay. Yeah. I think that, right. I mean, at the very beginning, um, you know, before even starting a business, you should have already identified uh, if it's, if it's B2C, um, you know, depending on the space, you should have identified, you know, 20 to 30 potential customers uh, that you sort of, round up as your personal advisory board and then ask them what they want, you know, identify sort of who you think that person would be. And if it's a B2B play where you're selling into businesses, I think that if you, if you can get a foot in the door at one or two businesses and really um, use them as a sounding board as to what you're doing, I think you have a huge leg up uh, and probably, you know, especially in the B2B world, maybe a first customer or two, which is a huge thing. Uh, that early and a lot of times they'll pay you to they'll pay you to build it if, if you approach them the right way you don't want to sell them you don't something you don't have but a lot of times they'll pay you to build something they want yeah yeah that's a great point okay now what about uh, hiring I think this is one of the trickiest things for people to wrap their head and their arms around and, and something that scares a lot of people so recommendations for how to go about making sure you're hiring effectively. Absolutely. And, and one of the big advantages that we've had at Rocket Dollar are um, our sort of executive team's personal network. Um, and I'll start at the beginning, how our executive team came together, because um, that is also hiring, right? It's, it's getting those yeah. people around you to buy in is, is hiring as well. And, um, you know, it, it's being... You know, when we when we first were joining or forming our executive team, we knew that we the so the first two founders, Henry, who's our CEO, and I, um, knew that we had a gap in our skills, and that was a technical gap. We knew that I'm not a technical, um, you know, I'm not a developer, I'm not a coder, I'm a marketer, and and Henry isn't either. He's an exe he's been an executive for a long time, and so we knew that just at the very beginning we were going to need a technical founder, uh, and we were lucky enough that that Henry through having been in the Austin ecosystem for so long, knew uh, someone that, that had the skills that we needed. And that was Rick Dude, who's our third co-founder. Um, so at the very beginning, it was just matching skills and then drawing on personal networks. And then as we started hiring employees, it was a little combination of, of, of two, right? One is holes we needed and the other one is our personal networks. Uh, and that worked great up until about 10 or 12 people. Uh, and then, you know, our network started to tap out. People are working on their own projects. People are, have their own things going. Uh, and the job market in Austin right now is incredibly competitive. Um, so then we, you know, we started going the more traditional way um, in hiring our last, our last six people that have joined our team. And then there it's really about your culture, how you operate, and, and what your intentions are. Um, you know, we've always been very open about the fact that we are a high growth startup with that, you know, you're going to need to work a lot of hours because we're really uh, in a growth phase and, and people get excited about that. So I think if, if, if you're hiring and people sense your passion, they'll buy into it. Um, and I think that's really important. And, and then just treating people right. You know, we've, we've only had one person leave our team uh, since we started the company two years ago, which in Austin, uh, that low a turnover is, is really rare. Um, and, and so we really just take care of the people we have. It's like the old saying that your best customers are your existing customers. It's the same thing with hiring. You're, you're the people that are already with you are the people you want to stay. And so you should work hard to keep them. That's great advice. That, that is great advice. Okay. Um, so you're a marketing guy. Talk some about what a uh, uh, business owner needs to know about 
marketing, like things they need to realize they need to do or money they need to spend or, you know, sort of like you can't live without X or you're going to have to make sure you're doing some sort of marketing. <laughs> but yeah, what would you absolutely. tell them? I would say I would say that now, um, in, you know, in today's day and age, I think that you know, obviously everybody has a different budget and everybody has different goals and everybody's selling different products. Um, but having a really good uh, fundamental understanding of the digital sort of space um, as everything goes online, I think is is really important. And the great thing is that there's some fantastic resources out there um, to learn sort of the basics of 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 the digital marketing space that you don't have to go out and be a Facebook expert or an Instagram expert or a Google expert um, to be effective. But I think that, I think that you have to be willing to play in that space because if you don't, it's just, it's just too hard now. And it's, it's pretty low hanging fruit now online. Um, the things you can do, the speed at which you can move at. Um, so I would say, you know, spend, you know, even if it's, a couple of weeks, just very immersed in the digital space, just so you know what you're being talked to about. Um, I think that that will help a lot of people. And then, you know, in terms of spend, uh, you know, I won't go into any exact numbers of how much we spend, but the way that we approach things is because the space moves so fast and because there are so many channels and opportunities, we got really good very quickly at tracking, testing, and either doubling down or stopping. Um, so we run a lot of tests, usually, usually, you know, very small spends, um, you know, in the four digits, you know, a couple thousand dollars here and there. Uh, and then we can start to see results. And because we've gotten so good at tracking um, our numbers, uh, we can really tell what's working and what's not. And we double down on what's working until we hit um, some sort of diminishing return. And then we just let it ride and we and then we move on to the next test. Uh, so testing constantly talking to your customers, using their language, I think is really important. You know, we, we sort of get so in the weeds about what we're doing that we don't use the language to describe our products that our customers use. But if you use the language that they're using, people are going to understand it, um, you know, a lot faster and they're going to, and they're going to have a better experience. So I would say that a basic understanding and then a willingness to, to test and to try new things um, will be a really good strength in the marketing side. That's terrific. Thank you. That that is really great. And I love the testing and and staying with what's working and you know realizing when something stops working and and moving on to something else. Sure. So, um how does a how does a small business uh what sort of decisions do they have to make? to make sure that they are keeping their information safe and secure and they're not putting themselves in uh, vulnerable situations? Um, Sure. So I think that, I mean, for us, especially as a financial services firm, uh, we have a lot of, of, uh, you know, pretty critical information, customer information on our, on our servers and in our, in our data rooms. Um, so security was something that we took very seriously at the, at the, from the very beginning. And, and even though we were a startup and we had, you know, hundreds of places to spend money, uh, we still elected to, to spend quite a bit on security and continue to, to this day. I mean, we've gone through, through SOC 2 audits and regu- you know, we've gotten audited several times and we have, uh, we actually have a, a white hat hacker that tries to break into our systems about once a quarter without telling us. And then he tells us where our oh, he tells us where our vulnerabilities excuse me are and uh, and you know it's something that we invest in heavily. Now, not every business will have that much information um, on their customers, but I think that you know we I do think that in today's day and age we are losing a, a, a we're fighting a losing battle with security. There's a lot of activity just not even in the country just outside trying to break into anything. Uh, so it's just, it's just the name of the game today is, is, is online security. And the nice thing is for a lot of small companies, they, you don't have to build your own software. You don't have to build your own website. You can do it through other tools that have security baked into them. So for example, if you, if you are, you know, selling, you know, whatever, if you have an online store, 
you know, you can go to Shopify and they have built in security into their systems. You can go to a HubSpot for a CRM and they have security built into their systems. Um, so you don't have to do it all on your own and, and you're certainly not alone in the space. Uh, but it is something that you want to uh, to take seriously. Yeah, that those are great points. Um, there, so I mean, we definitely need to be educated and mm-hmm. realize that we can take advantage of resources that make it less of a of a job or even less of a financial investment to make sure that we're mm-hmm. still being safe. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. so then let's circle back around to saving for retirement because if someone starts a business um they you know this ends up being one of these putting money into the business saving for their future you know that kind of thing so um from a business owner standpoint what advice would you give for uh them for saving for retirement Sure. Well, one of the things that that I think happens to a lot of small business owners, and it certainly happens to us, is that is that you know, and and this is a good thing I think, is that leaders you know tend to eat last, right? And so you're you're taking care of your employees, you're taking care of your of your team, of your customers, and sometimes uh, you forget to eat. And and while that's while that's a good thing, um, I don't I don't also don't think it has to be the the way to go about it. Um, so there's a book that I that I really like, and and it applies a lot to sort of um, you know single owner or maybe small partnership lifestyle businesses, and it's a book called Profit First, and it basically it basically you know the the advice is when you get your paycheck you pay yourself first you pay your savings first. It's sort of the same it's sort of the same advice that that you know you as the business owner should eat um, should eat first. You should be you know make sure that your operations that your pricing, everything is, is enough to sustain you. Um, and, you know, if, if obviously if it's the beginning of, of a business, you might have to, you know, you, you might not take a salary for a few months or even a year. I mean, and that's fine, but you know that going in. Um, but really just making sure that, that you are, that you're taking care of yourself, because if you're not around as the business owner, then your employees won't be able to stay around and your company won't be around. Uh, so you have to take care of yourself. Um, and I think that, that, that is from the ground up, um, you know, planning in your, your, uh, your expenses. And, and that book profit first talks about setting up different buckets. So you have an operations bucket, a tax bucket, a profit bucket and an owner's comp bucket. And if you can't make those percentages work, then you need to adjust something in your business so that you are being taken care of. That's so great. And, um, and that's uh, Mike McCallowitz. Right? Who who wrote uh, Profit First? I believe. I believe so. Let me do a quick. I forget the name, but do, me, do while we're talking. The only reason yeah, I'm asking yeah, is, is because it is. My yeah, guess. I'm meeting him tomorrow. Yeah, he's going to be here um, doing an event for an organization. I'm oh, involved fantastic! In. Yeah, I think it's a great way. Um, I think yeah. it's a great way to approach small business finances, and and even you know, doesn't even have to be a small business. Um, it's a great way to think about it, and and making sure that your margins are what they need to be, your operations are what they need to be, et cetera, et cetera. Yep, yep, I totally agree with you. That is really great. Okay, so if you were advising a small business owner about um, maybe best practices on making business decisions, what, you know, is there like a guiding principle that you follow? Is there something that you do that you think makes it um, easier or more effective to make decisions in the business on a, on a, I'll say daily basis? Yeah. I mean, I think that, that I would say is when you, whenever a decision is on the table, you know, there's, there's people that it's going to affect. It's going to affect you, your customers, your employees, or your stakeholders. Um, and depending on what the decision is, I mean, for us at Rocket Dollar, we have a very simple methodology for making decisions. Is it better for our customer? If it is, then we move forward. If it's not, then we don't move forward. Um, but then once we do make a decision, we, we stick to it until it's very clear that something's not working. So similar to the way that we market and we test things, 
we test decisions and, and, and sometimes there is that sort of grace period where we'll, we'll make a decision, but we'll test it with a small segment or with a small percentage and then see how it resonates. Um, and that works for some decisions and some decisions you, you can't test. And it's just a decision that, that you have to make. You have to come to a consensus about, we can like, for example, our executive team can, can sit there and, and we can, you know, debate passionately. But once the decision is made, the decision is made. And, uh, and I think that, you know, will quell a lot of anxiety of, of, you know, whether you did the right thing or didn't do the right thing. It's just once you, once you decide you have to, you have to move on it. And, uh, until the next one comes along. Um, but I, you know, it depends, it depends on the decision, but for us, it's, it's mainly, you know, is this good for our customers and is it good for our employees? So I really like that. So, so it's using a, like a guide of, uh, is this good for our customers, our employees? Is it good for, you know, does it serve the business and, and the business goals, whatever it is you decide is that, North Star that you're going to use. And then once you make the decision, just own it and don't worry about it. Just do it. You can, right? Yeah, and, I mean, because you're going to make good ones, you're going to make bad ones, it's life. Absolutely. And, and know that, you know, a, a lot of the decisions um, you make won't be the right one. And that's okay. Um, and I think, you know, bad decisions like like anything you know lead to lead to learning opportunities and you can after a failed decision or, or something that went badly you can go back and you can think okay well why did this happen why did it go wrong what would have been the right outcome what should have been the decision and you learn from it um and you know as cliche as that sounds every, you know everybody says yeah learn from failure but it, it is true that i mean there is a lot to be learned from bad decisions yeah yeah i agree i agree we put so much emphasis on making sure that we're making the right decision. And I think a lot of people end up not even making decisions because they're so wrapped up. Yeah. And then that's not necessarily, I mean, that is a decision in itself and it's not necessarily the best one. Well, not making a decision is rarely the right decision. (laughs) Yeah. So true. Sometimes, sometimes oh it is though, you know, so, but, but most of it, I would say 90% of the time sitting on your hands is the wrong thing to do. Yeah, I would too. I would too. And the problem is you don't know when the other 10% is uh, there. So yeah. just go ahead and make a decision, right? Yeah. You got to play the numbers at that point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. This is really great. Will you tell the listeners how they can uh, find you and whatever you guys have going on over there? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, if anybody is, is interested in, in the self-directed accounts that Rocket Dollar provides, um, I put together a little uh, coupon code. Um, so if you if you want to reach us at rocketdollar.com forward slash accelerate, and, uh, you know, if you're in the process of setting up an account, we'll knock $100 off your sign-up fee if you use Accelerate 100 um, in the referral section. And then if you want to find me personally, my email is thomas at rocketdollar.com. Uh, I'm pretty open. It's pretty easy to reach me. Um, you know, if anybody has any questions about anything, um, I'm right there. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me and having this conversation with me. And uh, listeners, thank you. I'm so glad. Um, And, and, you know, guys, you got some really good information here. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about this conversation was um, learning about alternative investment ideas, but also being able to hear from uh, you know, a, a startup, not necessarily a startup, but a founder. This is what I'm looking for. And really being able to hear um, some of the experiences and the process and the learning that, that went on there. And that's, you know, what this is all about. So uh, really valuable information. Uh, and i like to thank our sponsor to get a free trial of audible.com as well as a free audiobook. Just go to audibletrial.com slash business growth to sign up. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film, Powder Donut. <clears throat> Okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? 
I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The name your price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film, Pip 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 Powder Donut. <clears throat> Okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. Oh, man. That's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry. I'm going to need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus. The Bulbous Walrus. The Name Your Price tool. Only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. The average person experiences up to 10,000 marketing efforts each day. Those ideas are called from millions of possibilities. The CMO Confidential Podcast takes you behind the scenes to learn about the decisions, drama, politics, and glory that go with one of the most scrutinized jobs in the executive suite, the Chief Marketing Officer. Guests from all over the business world join Mike Linton, a five-time CMO, to share stories about what it's really like in the marketing universe.